Here we go. There's, so the purpose, as you know, of this show many years ago when we started this was to explore the deeper parts of intuition and how we could get it out of the um, closet, so to speak, and into the boardroom. And and I think we're like on 240 or so episodes. It's just been an amazing run. And and Dan, I'm so glad to have you on. I did not know until you and I started talking a while ago, just your depth of curiosity around intuition and how it can be applied in the business setting. So maybe start us off with what is your definition of intuition and why the hell should we care relative to being leaders and um, you know people involved in culture with respect to business? What, what, what's the big deal about this thing? <laughs> Well, I mean, the whole science of intuition is the study that explores how people make decisions and solve problems without relying on uh, conscious, you know, cognitive reasoning that happens, you know, where you stop and think. And and there's two, it, basically two theories on, on this. One is the theory that posts that there are two systems of thinking, right? And uh, one of them is system one is the first, and that's the automatic intuitive um, kind of fast thinking, which is what you want. You know, it's when it's built into your body, a great athlete can call up, you know, he has muscle memory, which is all part of intuition, right? And then the other one is slow, deliberate, analytical, right? And as, and so intuition is deeply steeped in the first one. And the importance of it is, is when you get into a crisis, you want to have your intuitions tuned so that you're going to be able to respond in a way to the crisis that's beneficial to your vision and not just kind of sh shirk away in self into survival and self-protection. So. Interesting point. So I was talking to uh, in email Chip Connolly, who's written a bunch of books, and I was able to meet him at a recent conference. And uh, we chatted a little bit as he was signing his book. And I told him about this podcast. And he later emailed me, he said, so Dean, what's your definition of wisdom versus intuition? How are they similar? How are they different? So I had to really think about it, you know? And so I'm curious, what's your definition of wisdom versus intuition? Well, wisdom could apply to both. I mean, wisdom is in, in my definition and what I've in my own studies, because I'm, a, I'm a, a word freak, wisdom would be knowledge applied effectively. Hmm. In other words, I apply the knowledge I have in an effective manner, and it makes a difference toward what matters to me, what I value. And that can happen both quickly, or it can happen through pensive thought, you know, you know, methodical thinking. And so I want to be able to align and be coherent and congruent with what matters to me, because, you know, I don't, you know, we we all have a. I have a saying: we're all criminal. Just some of us are more arrestable than others. And, uh, <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> so you know, be, being criminal is usually when I'm not true to myself or true to what I value, and I'm just doing something to relieve the instantaneous or the you know the immediate suffering, and I'm not thinking about the long term effects. And so, you know, for me. Uh, Wisdom is the ability to notice when that's occurring and then apply uh, knowledge in a way that is effective towards what I value, right? And so that can happen both quickly or it can happen through methodical thinking. It can happen automatically, kind of through a, a reaction that has been bred into me, or it can happen over, you know, uh, through me thinking and kind of going against my my immediate intuition and finding that there's something other or something new or something beyond what I have already thought or found to be effective. I always thought like in my research on intuition, which I keep hearing, you know, that the higher up you go in an organization that the more important intuition becomes, there's just uh, books and, and uh, research that just sort of backs up this idea that this larger um, scope of, of knowledge can be accessed through intuition, whereby the more linear analytical brain cannot. It's almost like you're walking into, I don't know, a room and one of your eyes is closed and you can't see everything. You can only see part of it. And I think intuition opens you up to more. So if that, if we agree on that idea that, that we're yeah, not absolutely. saying that the analytical thinking is not a good thing, we're saying it is a fine thing. 
but I think we both could agree that it's not necessarily the only tool that should be used. It's um, it's one and intuition can can buttress it, can can add more texture to a decision or to an insight. So how do you how do you help an organization or a leader rely on this sort of ephemeral type of skill that, as I understand it from a neuroscience perspective, lives in the part of the brain does, that does not access language. So it gets expressed through feeling. So how do we then help organizations or leaders bring in this circuit, sort of this superhuman decision-making tool called intuition um, and make it, you know, a common practice, like a swap analysis. I mean, how do yeah. we, how do we socialize it in so that we're not just seen as flakes? Oh man. Yeah. It's, that's a big question. There's a couple of things. Well, you know, the brain, there's actually three parts of the brain that the anterior circular, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is what monitors conflict, right? That's one. The other one is the insula, uh, is the insula, which is the awareness of internal body states. And then mm. there's the amygdala, right? The emotional processing. All three of those parts of the brain are actually part of um, intuition. So, you know, we, we the amygdala just takes off on us. If we feel like we're threatened, you know, the brain, the body, they have the brain has one two basic missions one preserve the body make sure the space stays alive two uh it's it it saves energy in case it needs the energy to keep the spacesuit alive and there's all kinds of studies around um you know i physically train quite a bit i ride bikes you know i ride long distance on bikes and a big guy so i'm not too good on the uphill but i'm great on the flat ground and downhill <laughs> but but uh what I want to do is train my brain. So when you hit a wall, right? You're, you, anybody who's exercised, you hit a wall. Well, that's your amygdala. That's the, your body going, hold on. Don't spend any more energy. But if you keep pushing, you break through it. You find a whole new, you know, well of energy within you. And that's, that's you breaking through the wall or your body's resistance to giving up, you know, giving more. And that happens in business a lot. Because your brain is trained very quickly to see to, if it thinks it's wasting energy, it gets bored, it gets distracted, it wants hmm. to get off of whatever it feels is wasting its energy. So if you're dealing with somebody on your staff that way, then you know you you want to catch that, right? The other part is conflict monitoring. So if I can catch my, you know, I've got to be aware of my amygdala. I've got to be aware of when I start to elevate. And if I find myself elevating and going into a survival state where I'm just going to react and, you know, I have two children and six grandchildren and, you know, they'll, they, I can tell when I'm reacting because they'll start to back off, right? Or they'll say something. Uh, and I've seen it with staff members because I can get excited about something or angry or edgy and I can see where they're going. If I'm aware of that, I can then catch the amygdala before it runs off with me. And then I can start to connect with and get in the moment with the conflict that is there. Conflict meaning things aren't going the way I think they should or the way I promised they would, the way somebody expected them to. And I can then connect and understand it. And that that that's that part of the anterior cingulate cortex does that in the brain. And then the insula is me being aware of my body when it's doing it at the same time, like uh, tensing up, breathing more shallow, um, flushing, those things. If I'm aware of those things, I can own them. They don't have to own me. And and so we do, I do actually, a num a, a, our training, I do, I have a very uh, particular training process that engages the cognitive neuroscientific neuroscientific sides of this where we work with people in very difficult situations like i i developed a curriculum for kids coming out of prison as kind of a way i give back and it's the number one curriculum in the u.s over the last 20 years about helping kids re-enter the the you know community after four you know their fifth generation fourth generation gang members can re-enter and 
you know, make a life that's rewarding and, you know, they'll live past 30, that kind of thing and not, so, you know, not go out and commit crime. So that's fascinating. So there's so many things you're talking about, but when you mentioned this program relative to these, these kids coming back into society, I, is that a case for intuition or is that something off on a whole nother track here? I mean, are you teaching these kids to trust and use their intuition? Yeah, they, well, their intuition is set pretty primarily around survival. And so it's re, when you retrain, they have to become aware of that. We talk about criminality as a mindset. And the mindset is based on a victimization. Anytime I start to externalize my experience or what I want to have happen, then what happens is my body begins to create, starts to protect itself. Lie, cheat, fight, flight, follow, fool, or freeze. It does one of those five things in order to preserve itself. And so if, if I can be aware of when that occurs, I can start to reinvent the way I'm relating to what's going on, right? So we work with kids, we work with executives the same way. When somebody walks into your office and they, they're they not on plan or they're resisting or they want to, they've got a question that seems you think you've answered it and you very may well have, but not to the point where they get it or, you know, you know how it goes. People yeah, come in and yeah. they have their own ideas. How so, do I then deal with that conflict in a way that's most beneficial, both to the organization itself and to the individual? So in your and, definition, can intuition be fully activated at the same time that our subconscious childhood issues get re-stimulated? Can Absolutely. they both agree? Because I, sometimes I wonder. So you're saying that they can both coexist? Yes. Because I, 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 maybe I, I'm, I want to make sure that I understand your definition. Because I sometimes think that if we could tap more into our intuition, our highest and best gets accessed more. Which means yeah. then maybe I'm able to over re reorient myself in such a way that I'm not being pulled down by my subconscious issues that have been around since I was six. And so you're saying, if I get this correctly, Dan, that maybe in your way of seeing it, that both could coexist at the same time. The issues oh, of the day from the, from years ago, I'm lit up like a Christmas tree because you remind me of my mother, my dad, whatever, and I'm wow. freaking out and I'm fight or flight. You're saying that can happen at the same time we have intuitive insight. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things we talk about in our in our leadership training, we do a leadership training that a public one as well as for executives, you know, in in house training. It's called the Revenant process, and in it, we talk about this: is either you have it or it has you. In fact, I'll ask. I'll say, "Who's come here to make a change?" And people will raise their hand. Who? And I tell them I have good news and bad news. And people, you know, I ask them what they want to hear first. Most people said they want to hear the the bad news first and they, uh, okay, great. The bad news is you're not going to change. In other words, we, you know, that you're, you have these upsets with that come up from the past or that you get angry at certain things or that you shut down or that you withdraw. Those things are still going to go on. They're going to come up. The question is how do you have them or do they have you? Have they become an ally? Do you understand them enough? Have you embraced them enough that you understand what they're signaling to you about how you're relating to the situation and how that relationship's either going to open up possibility or close it down? So okay. if somebody comes at me angry and I do, and I feel myself reacting, but I I go, oh wait, you know, maybe I need to stop and listen to what they're saying before I react to them. Okay. Okay. That. So I can hold, it informs me rather than derails me. So give me, let's, let's get practical here for a second. This okay. is, I loved all the, the sort of the theory and, and we can batter, banter around back and forth about definitions and so forth, but give me a scenario. Give me a person that, uh -huh. that you worked with and let's put it in a business setting. You know, let's, let's make it, you know, the business of intuition. We're going to use it in the business setting. And and either it's a fictitious one that you just are coming up with or one that you can recall because it actually happened. 
about one, what was the circumstance? Where was the dysfunction? Where was their challenge or opportunity? And what was your process to be able to help that person move through that? And what was the sort of the result? I'm curious to see if you have anything that comes to mind. And I know that I, I threw this at you unprepared. <laughs> oh, no problem. I got a bunch of them. Good. But let, let's do a business setting. Okay. I was working with a CEO. Uh, she is was top of her class from um, Wharton Business School, summa cum laude. She holds the record for roll-ups on Wall Street, mm. 61 in a year. And she had lost, she basically had bought a company. She had done it, taken one company, developed it into a multi-million, took it from a $3 million a year gross business, five years, rolled up a bunch of companies, sold it for $250 million, then went into the tech sector and borrowed, basically had the VC firm kind of get involved with her in the tech sector, right and three months after she got the money for the company that she was buying, the tech bubble burst. So it, it fell apart. Hmm. Now, in recovering, she she hired me to help her come in. She thought she had to dissolve the company. We didn't have to dissolve it. We were able to save it from the VCs. We were able to put you know restructure the debt and all that. And we were working together. In this process, uh, there was an account that she was going to take on. And I had asked her, I said, you know, we've been working together for some time. And I noticed that she had a tendency when something didn't work. She had two tendencies. One, when she wanted something, she had a tendency to do it anyway, even if her team wasn't behind it. And two, when things didn't go well, she'd, she'd hide. Mm. So I had brought this to her attention multiple times. And, and, um, when when this account came on, it wasn't a good. It, it was a big account. They're a very famous. Comp, they're very big. They're one of the biggest companies in America, mm. and the, she really wanted them on board, which I can understand why. But they wanted a one year contract, and a one year contract was just barely enough to recoup the expenses for us to set up and do what we did in this company, in their company, as a B two B thing. And I said to her, "Remember, we talked about this is not." really a good idea because you're already, we've been talking to the sales guys about not doing this, et cetera. And here you are doing it in these, these guys are famous for trying to steal people and start their own. And she mm. goes, no, I think this is great. So she, she did the deal anyway. And about nine months into the deal, they canceled the contract three months. They had a 90 day cancellation clause and they, they were, they wanted to take two of, their, her employees and start their own over there, just like we talked about. And and she was in a cash crunch and this occurred and she went dark. So I went to her house and she wouldn't answer the door. So I started throwing pebbles at her window and saying, I'm not leaving till you come out. This is, I'm here to support you. I'm not here to make you. And eventually I got her to come out and we we, we sat down. I said, now look, the best thing you can do is to go in and deal with the team with this and own it, right? We had this long discussion, but she was just going to disappear for a while. She didn't know what mm. to do because she was frightened, mm. right? And she was going to like, and of course, this would cause a lot of upset with the team because then the, you know, the CFO and the COO would have to deal with it without her leadership. And she got them into it, et cetera, et cetera. And there was, you know, they didn't want to get into it for the reasons that I mentioned before. But when we started talking, what I started after, I said, look, do you notice it started with you wanted the deal and you you wanted it so bad, you you wanted the short-term relief to risk the, but you're going to have long-term grief because you only had an annual contract. You barely recoup your expenses. The team was telling you about it and you got defensive. Do you remember that? She goes, yes, I do. Okay, good. Well, and so we explored all that just to get cognitively around that. And we kept working with it. Then when we sat down with the team and she accounted for what happened and what didn't work and she owned it and they everybody got on board and we corrected it and went forward. The next time a deal came through like that, it was amazing to watch her because she really wanted the deal. And she said out loud, I really want this deal, but for the wrong reasons. So mm. help me see how we can have this in the long run. 
Hmm. And then we sat down and worked with the team to do that. But she could catch it. She started catching. She told me, you know, when you first came to work here, when I hired you, I thought you were talking Chinese. Now, you know, a different language, Chinese, Japanese. But I didn't get what you were saying. And now I'm starting to see it. And she became quite robust in her willingness to deal with situations she would normally run from as she started getting a hold of her own machinery. And it was, you know, it was tied to other past issues in her life that she could identify. In fact, she did identify in the process of kind of working through and accounting for and resurrecting or re correcting the situation that she had caused, if that makes you sense. That's great. So you got a lot of things you mentioned in that example. Something accountability, ownership, I mean, radical candor, naming what's going on, identifying it, um, owning up to it to the team. If you were to say, Dan, I, um, like you got a business card and the back of the business card is your tagline. That is the core of what you do. What would it be? Uh I would say what you don't face now will defeat you later. Ah, okay. And so you're helping people face what they are trying to avoid. Yeah. And well, out I, of self preservation. It, it's come out of my own life. You know, I grew up with a schizophrenic mother. I was pretty traumatic. I went through a cocaine addiction at a young age. I've been clean for 40 years, but. That's how I was able to recover both my life and my marriage, which I've been married for. I've been with my wife almost 50 years, married 45 this year. And mm, congratulations. Um, and 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 that's it's a big part of our life. We work together. She is the head of the, she's the VP in charge of coaching. I'm founding partner at, at TNG with my partner, my other couple of partners. And um, we've worked together for years and we exercise this on a regular basis. Fantastic. So um, if I were listening to this and intrigued by what you're saying, and I wanted to do something today, what would you suggest? Well, I would suggest you go to our website and, and, <laughs> and we will do that too. Let's say I'm going to go to your website. I'm going to learn all about you, but is there something that I can do aside from getting to know you? Oh yeah, more, sure. You, I would read the book. Well, I mean, there's some books you can read and there's, you know, I'd pick up a coach who particularly uses our methodology, which is, has, is deeply grounded in language. There are, there are four mm. basic principles we utilize. And the first one is, you know, people always make the best choice they see available. It doesn't mean it's the best choice available. They make the bet. You neurologically always make the best choice you see available. Hmm. And, and when you, so when you see somebody that makes a stupid choice, you go, well, that was stupid. You know, like the, if I don't know if you ever watched the Darwinian Awards, the Darwin Awards, you know, where people, yeah. make dumb, you know, well, to them, that was the best choice they saw available, right? Because you might see a better choice. If you showed it to them, it would probably look like a threat to them, not a good choice because of the way they're thinking or perceiving that potential. Now, yes. knowing that people always make the best choice available, then that gives me an idea that helps me think, okay, I wonder what they were seeing that had them make this decision, right? I do that with the people I work with. If I'm coaching somebody, I've had them, my, my teammates do that with me. Like what made this a smart decision for you? Like not no bad, but tell us, right? Let's look at it. Right. Two, um, people will always act congruently with the way the world occurs for them. That's why we ask that question. Like, how mm. is the world occurring for you such that this was a good decision? Right. And the third one is the, the world occurs for people in language. So not just talking, but if I like, if I, I can show you this chair, it's just sticks and a piece of leather. We give it a symbolic name called a chair languaging chair you know what it's used for you understand what chair is when i come in sit down on the chair you go oh that's what that's for that's what a chair is and so if i can see how people are languaging so i can see how let's say that lady i was talking about uh, one of my clients i could see her withdrawing i i could see her overriding her team i can see the i can hear the language she's using to justify it 
Mm. So the next time that language comes up, I, 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 what I do is in my debriefs, cued her to how she frames things when she gets into that biased state. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. she can identify it at a very early level. Right. And then the, the fourth one is future language transforms current state. So if you and I are talking and I think I'm going to, you know, I'm going to lose half my income next year and I believe it and you believe you're going to double your income, those futures are going to produce very different people in the conversation. I'm going to be more reticent and cautious about how I move forward. I'm going to be, you know, more probably being concerned with efficiencies and returns, et cetera. You're going to be looking how to invest. You're going to be much more relaxed and probably in the, in the process because you believe you, what you're going to be doing is you're going to double your income. So you're going to have more resource, right? We're both going to be very distinct in this moment, given the future we think is coming. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's stuck, like when, you know, when you're talking, I, do a lot of work with sales teams and they just don't, you know, they, they're not getting it. They're procrastinating. They're not making their calls. It's because they don't get, they can win. So if I can sit down and listen to them, break apart how they're seeing the world, help them see other possibilities. The minute they see a new possibility, they'll want to pick up the phone. They'll want to get back on what they were resisting because they didn't see a future in it. The minute they can see a possible future, a new way of doing it, I always think about golf like this every time I see a good golf film and I go, oh, I can try that. I want to go back out and hit the golf ball where I, when I got off it, I, I don't want to play anymore. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's that kind of dynamic. So as a, as a leader, my job is to be a resource to my team to open possibilities. So when they get stuck, not only do they want to go again, but they start to learn how to do it for themselves and with each other. So I love this. So this, I, this last one, number four, future language, uh, transforms the current state. I think that's yeah. fantastic. It's a great way of, of framing that. Um, I want to ask you, but to dig into that a little bit more for a second, though, let me let me tell you my question. The question is this: I have dozens of books all over surrounding me with all sorts of future language written that I could read and I could even turn into. Um, Oh, affirmations that I could put on post-it notes all over my bathroom here, right? And yet, and I, you know where I'm going with this, right? There's a difference between the, the, the idea and then the paradigm that supports it. It's the, the words mean one thing, the paradigm means something else. The feeling and the, and the knowledge are sometimes very two different things. So I, otherwise, why not just go goddamn read a book on finance and be a millionaire? Because you've got future state language right there all the time. Great so then, question. I how do it. you then, and I love this because I think that's the crux of so much when it comes to growth and change is like, yeah, but the knowledge is out there. Just Google it. But that's yeah. not enough. You have to change the mindset in order to match up to those behaviors. How do you help companies and people do that? Oh, that's a great question. So there's a, there's a, there's a framework, obviously I'm giving you a framework. Mm -hmm. So yeah, everybody's into vision. There's, you know, that's the big thing. Every consultant's going to come in and talk vision. And a lot of them are really good at it. You know, uh, you want to have a good vision. You got to have a vision and a mission. You want to know what the future looks like. But then the where the rubber meets the road, see, there's two conversations. They don't mention the second conversation. I don't know how many of really you realize it. But the first conversation is get that vision clear. Know what you're aiming at. Now, when you know what you're aiming at, you're neurologically, your brain will create a hierarchy of concerns based on what you say you're committed to, what you're really aiming at. Mm -hmm. And you find out what you're really aiming at by engaging current reality, which is nothing like the future you are committed to having. But it is the necessary um, resource to bring that future forward. So the next step is then, okay, good. That's your future. What's your current reality? And most people have a very hard time just connecting with current reality. Like current reality involves is pretty complex. And what people don't realize is it's very dynamic. So it's an ongoing, that's where awareness comes in. 
current reality is what's happening physically around me. What what are people doing? What are people not doing? What are people saying? What are people not saying? It's also what people are experiencing and thinking. So if I'm working with a team and my team, how they're thinking about what's going on is part of the current reality and it's not obvious all the time. And you can see how your team's thinking about something by the way they're engaging the process. And that's where people, there's a paradox. I need to get with the current reality to produce the future. If I don't, I won't have the resource for the future because the resource for the future is in the current reality. Mm. It's the old stoic saying that the obstacle is the way. Right. I get that. And it's almost like you're having to hold two different realities in your brain at the same time. The current reality with the the eyes wide open, understanding it, what really is, as well as not letting that diminish the future state of which you are trying to achieve and one would say well it's the we were grow we grow up into a scientific we're going back to intuition now we're growing up into this very much linear approach if i don't see it i don't believe it right if i if it's not in the physical world then how can it be true but all of a sudden you start coming up with this idea about creating a future language for something that isn't here yet i don't have as much uh credibility for that i don't lend as much credibility to that because it's not real yet and yet at the same yeah. time, I'm spending all this time working on what is real. And then I kind of go, oh, shit. Uh, you know, my finances are screwed. My wife is, you know, leaving me. Whatever your current reality might be. And that becomes what gets reinforced over and over and over again. And as we all always know, that what you think about, you probably attract more of. So it's it's an interesting dichotomy to be able to manage both at the same time. Well, it, it's a paradox, right? I mean... And this is probably probably one of the biggest limitations of Western thinking of our own culture is we think if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. But right. that's, it, it may not exist yet, but it exists right here. Yes. And this is, you know, I play golf and, you know, Ben Hogan said the game of golf is, happens in a five inch, five inch space between your ears. Right. Right. And, and because you're, you're thinking what you're going to be doing now, if I look at current, and when you say, yeah, you know, we, we got to connect with current reality, but it's also connecting with my bias about the current reality. Mm. Like if I think something's impossible, that has to get vetted. Because if I try to do something like a good soldier, like an imposter that I don't think is possible, I'm, it's going to show up incongruent with the people I'm working with. So how do I have conversations? And this is what we work a lot with. How do we bring to the surface? the conversations of doubt so that we can harvest them for possibility. And that is not, you know, it's like, it's, it's uh, like mining for gold. And, it, and there's a very specific process that framework that I use to do that, but it takes into account the willingness to own my own cognitive processes and my in and, and how my intuition, because intuition carries bias with it. Right. And so right. if I'm not aware of my bias, I won't understand the blind spots of my intuition. And the more I understand the blind spots of my intuition, the more I will know consciously to look into them to make sure I'm seeing everything or as much as I, the biggest possibility I can. It's again, it's a great point, Dan, but it, it, I, I do think, and I sometimes struggle with this myself, is like, I look at doubt as almost like the enemy, like, oh no. Or we have yeah. a company or a team that says, we're going to create a new culture. We're going to expand by 30% this year. And people go, but I have doubts. They go, oh, you're not a team player, right? You got to get on board. And and I and there's this great process. Of, oh, I forget his name who did this, but it's like a pre-mortem, basically. Instead of looking in the rear view mirror, you look in the future, which just says, okay, if, let's assume everything falls apart. Why did it fall apart? And using that process uh -huh. of doubt to be able to mind for ways right to go forward. I love that idea. But I think that we got to somehow socialize the idea that doubt is not a bad thing so long as it doesn't become the primary thing. It, well, as long as it's not cynical or cynicism, you know, because mm. it, it, I can use doubt to hide behind, but I can also use doubt to sharpen my plan, my way of being, my thoughts, my, my efficiencies, et cetera. So the question is, what am I aiming at with my doubt? That's what I meant by aim, because aim can shift in a moment. 
right? Yeah. I could one minute be aiming at the future I'm committed to. And then somebody brings something up that seems really radical that I'm, I'm not going to, I don't think I can overcome. And now I might just start aiming at defending myself or protecting myself or, you know, getting away from this person because they make me feel bad about what I said I wanted because they're drawing my attention to a possibility I don't want to see. Like yes. I've got to break that down. And, and that, you know, most anybody who's an entrepreneur is they're thinking with some complexity and they have a tendency to want to think more process oriented than to think, to think about their thinking. And first is thinking about my thinking while I'm thinking about the process. <laughs> like, why did, why is this such a good idea? Like most of the time when a team breaks down, what they're dealing with is the symptom, not the problem. Right. And they, the symptoms easier to put your hands on. The problem takes some forensics, takes an inquiry that people feel like it's a waste of time to do because they're slowing down, but they don't realize when you slow down, if you find the problem, when you go, you're going to be much more powerful, right? So right. we find that slowing teams down is probably the most difficult thing in our work, slowing them down long enough to identify the problem and not get trapped in the symptoms like whack-a-mole, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, and it's, there's a, there's a certain amount of courage that it seems to be the underlying theme that we <laughs> haven't brought up by the leader, by the participants to kind of go where we haven't gone before to face our fears, to face those doubts, to mind for those, to have the radical candor, to have this conversation. And I, I've, as you all know, you know, if, if there weren't, if it were easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's That's, it's a yeah. it's part of the human condition in some ways. So Dan, uh, again, this has been great. I would love to continue our conversation for for days on end. Maybe I should just drive up to your place and we should <laughs> continue this at your place well, up in uh, Idaho. <laughs> just come out to Hawaii. We're doing a, a revenant process, which is our leadership training in Honolulu in June. We're going to do it's a four day wow. intensive where th we actually exercise this in real time and there, it's you know it's not simulated it's real and we have we'll have about anywhere from 30 to 40 people and uh executives and we'll spend four days in an intensive doing that in hawaii you do this at other locations though i think i saw on your website that don't you also yeah, do we something also, in italy or yeah uh, we do we do we this year we're not going to do it in italy but we do we're going to do another one in boise idaho okay maybe by the end of the year we do them in la as well and if they go to the website, people can see the different dates and where they're at. Right. Well, to close us off here, Dan, again, thanks for all this wonderful information. Uh, how else can people connect with you and your work? Instagram, Dan underscore Tacchini. Um, LinkedIn, uh, Take New Ground or Dan Tacchini. I'm on there on as my name. And, um, and then there's takenewground.com which is our, our website. And then Fantastic. we have, we have a podcast. We have a 200 episodes or up to 200 episodes. It's called the naked leadership podcast on Spotify and Apple. Fantastic. Dan, thanks for your time. This has been great. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Dean. You bet.